I think I finally cracked the Rob Bell code here, and a review of uh, one of his chapters in his book kind of reveals to me that he's working along the lines of process theology. Pretty deep subject. Could have did a little better with uh, the presentation, in my opinion, but we'll explore all that, try to explain process theology to you. This is Matthew Garnett. Welcome to In Layman's Terms. <music> Okay, so as promised last week, we're going to get into what I really think Rob Bell's trying to do in his book, which is process theology, and we're going to explain all that as we as we get to it. Uh, very confusing book, meandering, that sort of thing. You can just take it as that, uh, because it pretty much is, but I want to kind of let you into what I think he's trying to do, but fails. But before we get to all that, I want to encourage you all to go to laymanstermsradio.org for two reasons. Check it. Check out the updates to the Well Project. We've raised the funds for that along with our partner church, and that's going to be going forward. I'll keep putting updates uh, on that and uh, and just letting you know how it goes when we get a drill. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait for those kids to have indoor plumbing, water, everything else in the kitchen, all that stuff. Um, also, as you know, we have our Men of Steel fundraising project going on. I need professional help to start this uh truck driving school for former inmates i think it's a great idea um i've you know done done some preliminary research on this and i think the money will be well placed and i think we can actually pull this off which would be a really amazing service to guys who are having trouble finding jobs so please go to laymanstermsradio.org check it out donate to the men of steel project and um yeah in the meantime let's get on to rob bell so here we go I was raised in a modern world that taught me a particular view of things based on subjects and objects. There's a fixed, set world out there doing what it does. And then there are our thoughts and observations and insights that exist independent of all that. You observe it, you measure it, you take notes, you notice, you view. It's going to do what it's going to do. And you can be here or not, witness it or not, study or note or learn or observe or not. There's the subject and the object and a clear difference between the two. There's a line and you're over here watching and the thing you're watching is over there doing whatever it's going to do on the other side of the line. But we now know that there is no line. There is no out there, out there. To witness it is to affect it. There's only this one reality and in it, everything is connected to everything else. This reminded me of an ancient Jewish prayer called the Shema. It's in the book of Deuteronomy and it has this line about how the divine is one. The Hebrew word for one there is the word echad, which is a oneness made up of multiple parts, like a unified community. All divisions take place within a unity. All parts exist within wholes. All wholes form one whole. Everything that appears to have nothing to do with everything else is, in the end, connected to everything else. All that weirdness and strangeness and connection that I had felt for as long as I could remember was, in some hard-to-explain way, real true. The world is way more relational, more interactive, and more connected than anybody ever told me. I had intuitively sensed it, but now that feeling was being given language. What a gift. Take apart an atom, and you discover it's made of particles. And when you observe those particles, you discover that your observation of those particles affects what they do. There's a phrase we use when we aren't going to participate. We say, I'll just sit this one out. But the truth is, nobody is sitting this one out. No one is just seeing what happens. Seeing shapes what happens. It's a participatory phenomenon, this universe we call home. We all belong. We're all a part of it. We're all already participating. We always have been. This took me back 
to what I had always believed about the gospel announcement that everyone is loved and everyone belongs, and there's nothing anyone can do to earn what we already have. I thought of all the hours and energy I'd spent wondering if I was good enough, if I belonged, if I had a part to play. I saw all that for what it was, unnecessary. The starting point is belonging. It always has been. My life, my work, all these people I was speaking to, all that I was learning about atoms and particles, it was all running together, blending and mixing and creating something new. So maybe I should add to the meme there, which is a bit tongue in cheek. I you know, have to put it in the postmodern, post-structuralist, neo-Marxist, critical theorists, which as a, as a sort, uh, Bell is, I am convinced, a part of all of that. However, maybe I should have added uh, process theologian just to pique the interest of the listeners, right? <clears throat> because I believe, really, if, if you're going to make any sense of, of Bell's book here, uh, you've got to bring into account this notion of uh, this philosophy of process, which was um, originated uh, by Alfred North, uh, North Whitehead uh, back in the early 19... Uh, teens, 20s, aughts, <clears throat> that period of time. And essentially, this philosophy, just very basically, now, Whitehead is, is a complicated uh, genius. Uh, maybe a mad genius, but a genius nonetheless. He was a mathematician on par with uh, Bertrand Russell, another uh, famous mathematician and philosopher, Seems like uh, mathematics seems to kind of lead to these things when we uh, when we <clears throat> look at the the history of philosophy. But at any rate, the guy's a genius. No no question about it. Uh, he was a genius, and he wrote some very very deep and difficult uh, philosophy to understand, and then attached that to theology, particularly Christian theology, and tried to critique where Western Christian theology had gone wrong, and why it couldn't possibly be the way that we have talked about it for the past couple thousand years since uh, since the time of Christ and so on and so forth. But very, all that to say, very basically, this is going to be a very basic overview of process theology. Now, I was exposed to this when I was at Claremont, so I can kind of recognize this stuff when it, when it comes down the pike. Essentially what process philosophy and theology uh, argue or claim is that everything in the universe is a process. So I'm I'm not Matthew Garnett, human being in you know this situation, and you can describe give, give me all the descriptions of whatever it is, whatever it is uh, you think I am. To Whitehead, uh, that's an abstraction. So so an abstraction, just to make that very simple, is like numbers. So if I if I say two, you know what I you know what I mean by two, but if I ask you to show me two, you, you can't show me two. Uh, you know, here's here's two things, my cigar cutter and my lighter. That's two things, but it's not two. The 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 number two is an abstraction. If I show you two hands, th those are hands. It's not two. The two is an abstraction, is, is an abstract way of describing the amount of things that I have. And so for Whitehead, uh, they, you know, they really started to take this uh, a step further to say that uh, to, to defi define somebody as uh, this concrete time and place entity, it, it's not true. It's an abstraction. What What is reality? And this is what this was... Uh, Whitehead's magnum opus, uh, Process and Reality. This is what he wanted to, to talk about. This is what all philosophers want to talk about. What is real? And this is what Whitehead was, Whitehead was trying to get at. And he said, no, no, we are not humans necessarily. Unless by humans you mean we are a process. We are going through... We're all, the, all of us are these processes. Um, everything in the universe is a process. Anything you my encounter uh, is, is a process. And we are in process of moving toward something. So the way Whitehead described this was these pro processes come into interaction with each other and 
when that interaction happens, then a uh, limitless bound of possibilities is available to those two processes coming into interaction. I would encourage you to go listen to one of my favorite philosophers uh, describe this because it's very difficult to describe in just a few in just a few minutes. But um, uh, Arthur F. Holmes uh, uh, was a teacher at Wheaton College, philosophy teacher, and he has three lectures on Whitehead and process uh, philosophy and theology. I would highly recommend you go listen to those and and suffer through them. They're difficult, but try to understand what he's getting at here. Uh, but he but he draws this line on the board. So here I am, Matthew Garnett. I'm this I'm this process going on, and you know, as as my process is going on, here comes, you know, Jennifer, who's my wife, right? Another process going on, and we intersect, and then out of that comes all of these possibilities. We could just say hi to each other and never see each other again. We could um, ask one another on a date, and then you know the process goes on and. So what the 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 idea really uh, that Holmes drives at is that Whitehead is a Hegelian at heart. So in other words, the whole world and everything that what what reality, what is real, are these processes coming into contact to, with each other? Where there's a, a, a thesis, where here I am, I'm Matt, here's Jen, she's Jen coming in. I say let's go on a date, and she says no. So, so thesis, antithesis, maybe not the perfect example, but that's, that's the idea. I've got this idea about what could be. She has another idea about what could be. And so when those two processes interact, they deal with all of these possibilities uh, that are available. And from all the possibilities, the two synthesize and <clears throat> come to what Whitehead calls the decision. So, fortunately for me, I said to Jen, let's date. Jen said, say, she didn't necessarily say this, but says no. And I convince her and we decide to date. Right. So, so thesis, let's date. Antithesis, let's not date. Convince, synthesis, we move on. Right. And then from, from that process... Uh, you know, might consider Jen and I a, a process. A marriage is a process, right? Uh, we are processing, and then we come into, into interactions with other processes, and we're doing this all the time. Uh, again, Holmes uh, likens this to something like waking up to your alarm clock, right? The alarm clock goes off, and you mistake it for the phone. So you're you, <laughs> lying in bed, abruptly awakened to this loud ringing which you immediately interpret to be uh the telephone the process of the clock and yes the the, the clock itself while we might traditionally think of it think of it as in its true sense as an object it's a process itself and you come into contact with that alarm clock and mistake it as a phone and you pick it up and it just continues to ring very very loudly in your ear and you all of a sudden go oh it's my alarm clock not the phone see see Wake up, thesis, it's the phone. Antithesis, the alarm clock is telling you, nope, I'm not the phone, I'm the alarm clock. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what reality is uh, for Whitehead. It's not the objects, it's not the matter, it's not the material things that we observe or don't, this is what Bell's talking about. It's, uh, you know, he was taught, uh, you know, that... Uh, you know, in, in the modern world, that, the, that you, there are these things and that things, and you can observe them or not observe them, or you can uh, interact with them or not interact with them. What Bell is talking about here, I'm convinced, is straight up process theology, where um, that's, not, that's not at all uh, the reality of things. The reality of things is, in fact, the process. All right? So, <laughs> maybe very simply speaking, it's the journey, man. It's not about, well, let's look at this and try to analyze it or, uh, or categorize it or anything else. What it's about is interacting in the, these, these vast numbers of interactions we have and the process that moves us toward what? Well, that's where God comes in. This is where process theology comes in. Now, first of all, God offers all the possibilities. 
God is not God in the traditional theistic sense. Uh, he's not God even in the traditional deistic sense. He, he, White has, has, has God in a completely different category. Um, and in fact, I would dare say that Whitehead, well, I'm not dare, I wouldn't dare say, I would in fact be shocked that if I were able to have a conversation with, with Whitehead, um, he would say, yeah, I completely redefined the traditional meaning of God because it had to be for stuff to make sense. So he'd say, because traditionally we define God as something other than how Whitehead defines him. We define him as creator. Whitehead would have completely rejected that. Um, we define him as all-knowing, all um, all-powerful, and all-present. You know, the omnipresent, om, om, omnipotent, um, omniscient. Uh, we would define him uh, in similar terms as Aristotle, the unmoved mover. See? And notice what Bell did in that last clip. He talked about the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. See? I think that talks about how God is one God. Not many gods, not many possibilities, uh, but how God is a, is a unity uh, in Trinity, but he is one. He is the unmoved mover that, that Aristotle dreamt of later on, just by naturally observing things and, and using his own reason. That's what I think is going on here. However, Bell takes Whitehead's position, right? Where God is not, where 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 God is not the center of attention, where God is not the one unmoved mover, as Aristotle would say, or even later Aquinas would ex extrapolate from. No, no. Uh, the reason the Shema is there is to talk about how, like Bell said, we've got all this this unity um, that God is a part of us, and, and in fact. The, uh, the 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 uh, main piece of Whitehead's theology was the the one. If you're going to point to a concrete reality, the only one concrete reality you can point to is creativity. And in fact, God is not the creator, as we as we traditional theists might say. Um, he is in fact the exemplar, the par excellence of a creative being who gives us all these possibilities and in fact lures us toward this is this is whitehead theology now and, and I think Bell's as well as I think this is exactly where he's, he's going with this to say that and I well let me just finish this thought uh, that that God by whitehead's definition is the exemplar of what we should be, and he is luring us toward these greater possibilities where we have the thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? This Hegelian idea uh, that I that I think um, that I think Whitehead, and I've learned this from Holmes. This is again most of us from Holmes lectures. He made the most sense out of process theology, and you know, even in the the two years that I had at Claremont and that, you know, Holmes made the most sense of it for me. And that makes, that makes the most sense. Uh, it's to say that the God is the, he's not the orchestrator of it, but he is the one providing these possibilities, trying to draw us forward into this larger process. That's going to result in something beautiful. And that was kind of the language that Whitehead would usually talk about is talk about something aesthetically appealing, resulting from these processes interacting. Right? And he makes some powerful arguments. Um, too bad Bell really doesn't quite crystallize it here, I'm afraid, at least in my estimation. Uh, but that to say that, you know, last week, you know, I, I really couldn't, was telling you, I really couldn't make much heads or tails of what was going on here. Well, as I kind of started to think through this, I think that's what Bell's trying to do in this whole book, is to show you that all these processes, you know, his grandmother, his, you know, his grandfather who passed away, you know, his his uncle who who was unfortunately killed um, as a child. You know, he was trying to talk about all these processes interacting, uh, you know, coming coming to the table with with a thesis and antithesis, and then a synthesis, and then going on, and that synthesis comes and interacts with another process. And there's again 
uh, thesis, uh, an antithesis, and then a, a synthesis, and, and so the process goes, and that's kind of how he really talks throughout this chapter. Now, in, in Audible, it's chapter five. I'm not sure. I didn't look it up. Uh, what chapter this is in the actual book, uh, but that's that's really what Bell's driving at here, and I and yeah, I, I kind of wish he would have, you know, just come, kind of just tipped his hand and say, hey, this I'm talking about. You know, let me tell, let me introduce you to Alfred, Alfred North Whitehead. And process philosophy, process theology, and tell you why I think that's really what's going on here. That's the reality. That's where the real thing is. See, um, and um, hopefully some of you are anticipating the dangers and all this, uh, the problems, uh, and and the potential uh, pitfalls of all that. But we'll get to it there. Um, just for now, I just wanted to as best I could give you a, a, a very basic, broad overview of what process theology is. Um, again, the most crass way I can put it is, it's not about, it's about the journey, man. That's the idea, that's the idea I think, behind most of this. Um, that's what's real, at least. That, that was the title of Whitehead's magnum opus, Process and Reality. The journey is the real thing. The process is the thing. It's not this, you know, whatever I can pick up here. You know, my cigar cutter. It's it's not those things. It's not my hands. I can I can show up to you. That's that's not what is empirically real. At the end of the day, what is real is the process. That's what we all experience. That's what we can all point to. You can say, hey, I experienced that thing. And in re it, to be honest. It's a very difficult argument to refute because I can tell you I had this experience. You can't refute that. I mean, if you go out and find evidence that I'm lying, maybe, but you know, especially an internal, uh, uh, you know, experience that I had with maybe some idea I was interacting with or some person I was interacting with. You can't really refute personal experience. It's very difficult to do. That's why we, we try to rely on on numbers and, and data and that sort of thing. But see, here's the, that's the thing. Even that's not the real deal, because what uh, what what we what at the end of the day boils down to what we can demonstrate, what we can put forth as something that's real is our experiences, and our experiences are as we as processes are interacting with other processes that's what Bell's going to kind of jump off of and talk to you it's not about hey let's try to figure out what's real from observing this and observing that and compiling this data and try to figure out you know hey well look there seems to be an order to this thing we can categorize it here and that nah that's not that's not at the end of the day really where we're going to uh, find reality we're not going to find reality there we're going to find reality in our experience and in the process of us going as processes through this universe and processing together and we'll find out that really at the end of the day what the shaman meant is that we are that god and all of us are one um and that's what i wanted to say just a minute ago is that not that uh bell is completely off here but he's a little bit off uh he almost makes it sound like we're, the, the, it's a pantheistic thing like god is in everything um or, or, or God is everything. So we're all, you know, God is kind of this, what, what we would say, is, you know, in, in a tr traditional pantheistic mode that, that God is everything. And we were just these people kind of participating in the being of God. That's that's not what Whitehead proposed. What, what Whitehead might rather say is that God is in everything. So he was a panentheist. So God in everything. Right. So when, again... The, the process of me interacting with my alarm clock, yeah, God is in the process that is both me and my alarm clock. He is in those things, drawing us forward to this greater aesthetic, this greater good, this greater beauty. All right, that's that's what process theology is, and I think that's what Bell is trying to drive at here. Not sure, just heard a lot of verbal clues, you know, the dog whistles, right? Um, it's kind of some of the language you, we used to use back at Claremont. Uh, but again, I think uh, yeah, I think I wouldn't be too far off here if I were to you know write Rob Bell a letter and say, hey, you know, was Chapter Five all about process theology? 
Wouldn't be surprised if, yeah, you better believe it, the whole book was about that. Wouldn't be surprised to hear him say that. Especially given his, his definition of the oneness of God uh, from the Shema, which is completely uh, heretical. It's not, that's not how we've ever, ever in the history of Christianity, or Judaism for that matter, understood the Shema. <laughs> you can't point to one uh, place where a, a Jewish rabbi would say, oh yeah, that's what, that's what they meant by the Shema. I, you, know, you might be able to, so maybe some more liberal Jewish rabbis, but I'm talking about historical rabbinical tradition. You're just not going to find it. What they talked about was there was cultures and societies throughout the ancient Near East which worshipped many gods, and, and the one true God came along and said, no, 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 that's not how this is. Uh, I hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. There is one God and not many. Right, and I'm not in everything, and I am not everything. I am God. And my ontological being is a, is a part from that, is how this has always been taught. Um, and process theology aside, and the brilliance of Whitehead aside, um, I haven't heard anybody uh, uh, re refute that uh, very well at all. And we'll talk about the imp implications and danger of that if we can. I'm going on a little long in this segment because I wanted to get you get your feet wet with process theology. Again, this is stuff you should get interested in. It's really fascinating stuff. Uh, Arthur F. F. Holmes, look him up. Arthur F. Holmes on YouTube. Three great lectures, an hour each, and he'll walk you right through process theology. Yeah, you're going to put your thinking cap on. But, you know, it might not hurt these days. All right, let's see what else Bell has to say here. Your power is important. You claim it. You use it. You exert it. You rise up in your power and you give yourself to the ones you love and whatever it is you're here to do. But then you learn that power has limits. That's that truth I was feeling my way into. And when you get to the outer edges of your power, you meet your powerlessness. That's where I was. And that's what was happening in that rose garden. I was being given a new vision of how it all works. You start with the gift of it all. You begin with the wonder and awe that you're even here and alive and breathing, and you even get to do this. That's the starting place. You always come back to that. It's all a gift. You receive it, and then you give what you can. You embrace your impotence, your powerlessness, your lack of control over the outcomes. You make peace with all that you can't do, with your limits, with all the people you can't help. Giving the gift is reward enough. That's where the life is. That's where the joy is. And then, on top of that, every result, every bit of progress, even one person responding favorably to the gift you're giving becomes an astonishing thrill. It was such a gift that you're even here and you got to give yourself to that, whatever it is, whoever they are. And then it actually helped. Someone appreciated it. Someone was inspired. You got a good result. Amazing. It's like stacking grace on top of grace on top of grace. Father Jack and I talked for the rest of the day and he continued to be kind and generous and ruthlessly honest. And what kept coming back to me was that one word, gift receiving, and then passing it along, opening up to power and force and energy way beyond me, letting it move through me. I felt this new life surging up within me. I don't need people to be anywhere else. I can meet everybody where they are with love. I'll give the biggest gift I can give. I could do that. That sounds fun and slightly absurd, which reminded me of all those atoms I've been learning about that were teaching me how weird the world is. We're on a ball of rock hurtling through space, our bodies replace themselves every few years. Everything that appears solid is ultimately a series of relationships of energy involving atoms, which are mostly empty space. Particles come in and out of existence, and we don't really know where they go or where they come from. We're each made of atoms that used to be other things and other people, and those atoms will leave us and go on to be other things and other people. And this is happening all the time. I could feel a lightness welling up within me, like gravity had less effect than it had before, like a weight had been taken off like the divine was winking at me, like I was gradually being let in on the joke. I started to read those Jesus stories again through a new lens. He tells a story about people showing up to work in a vineyard at different times of the day, but then at the end of the day, everybody gets paid the same amount. What an odd story, which is his point. It's like the story is asking, do you get it yet? Of course it isn't fair. Since when was fairness the ultimate goal? The parable isn't an instruction manual on how to properly run a vineyard. It's a parable about how your heart works. Grace isn't fair. Love isn't fair. Joy isn't fair. They exist in other categories. These phenomena at the heart of the human experience that fill us with joy and meaning and love were never about fairness or making sense or how serious you could be or how well you could prove your worth or what you could accomplish or what you could get people to do. 
The workers all get paid the same because you can't divide the infinite. I started to see what all those yogis and Buddhas and monks and nuns and sages and gurus across the ages were smiling about. This experience we're all having here, this event we're born into, it's profoundly, deeply, fundamentally off, odd, strange, entangled, connected. It doesn't follow any of the rules we thought were the rules for how it works. A particle disappears in one place and then appears in another place without traveling the distance in between. It's like the whole thing is winking at us. And the ones who move us, inspire us, spur us on, they're in on the joke. That's how they're able to help us like they do. They've made peace with how absurd it all is. They don't take themselves too seriously, which is why they have such a serious effect on us. They smile, they walk through a rose garden fierce with the conviction that it's all about giving the most generous gift you can. They're the ones who aren't here to prove anything because proving was never the point. They're the ones who don't need to win because that was never the game in the first place. They're the ones who truly disrupt. They're the dangerous ones. Yes, so I think that's a perfect example. Uh, Bell talks about quantum physics a little bit there. This was a big uh, Whitehead thing. He talks about events. This is one of Whitehead's favorite words to talk about. It, it's not. It's not this cell or this particle or, or any other material thing you can observe for Whitehead. It was the process, and I'm sure it would make it makes complete sense to me that Bell felt like a weight was lifted. Uh, when whoever he was talking to here in this rose garden uh, said that, you know, you have a gift, uh, give the gift, uh, as be, you know, when you can, best you can, but, you know, you're not, you're not going to be able to do it for everyone. And the way Bell interpreted that is, hey, I'm just a process. Um, and when I interact with another process, we're going to do our thesis, antithesis, synthesis thing, <clears throat> and that's how things are going to go forward. It's, it, it really has nothing to do with how much effort or uh, how convincing I am. Does it have, have to think anything to do with, with logic or, or empiricism? Does it have anything to do with um, you know anything else other than, hey, I'm this process going, going through space and time. And when I interact with another process and when other processes uh, inter interact with me, then I'm going to offer my thesis and the other process is going to offer its antithesis and then there'll be resolution and we'll move on um you know so in in some ways uh, bell bell is he in this chapter he misses the god piece of the the process where where god is is pulling us in this direction and he and he he does talk a little bit about this later so um, it may sound like Bell is saying, ah, it doesn't matter what you do. Just, you know, it's about the journey, man. Just cruise through life. Deal with, you know, deal with other processes. You know, as you come across other processes, that's how Whitehead might even uh, redefine people. We're processes. As you interact with other processes, you give your gift. They give their gift. And you, the, two, the two of you decide from those two gifts, which is the best way to proceed. And that's how you proceed. Um, and so... Uh, you know, it, I, again, I don't think Bell would say it doesn't matter what you do. I don't, I don't think that's the point. I think what he what he's saying is is that as as you, you know, the Rob Bell process go through the process, being drawn by God, with with the the definition of God that Whitehead gives this 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 power that's that's. Uh, perfectly good and knows all the possibilities is drawing us forward and giving us new possibilities. That's a man. Bell loves that kind of language, giving us new possibilities, giving us these new possibilities. Then, Hey, we, we, man, we lay those new possibilities on the other processes uh, with which we interact. And, you know, if they're not, if they're not kind of thinking along these lines of these new possibilities, these endless possibilities, uh, then, you know, we have a real chance to, to synthesize, their thinking with our thinking along some specific line that will move the process forward. And Bell's going to get into a little bit of that um, here in a second. I'd been living with that weight of trying to wake people up to the dangers of the American empire and to the earth care crisis we are in and the need for all of us to go on our inner journey to deal with our issues. I'd carried that burden. 
I'd talked with a straight face about how I was here to change the world. I'd read those reviews and wished I could just go out and win every single one of them over, one by one by one by one. And it was so incredibly exhausting, exhilarating and meaningful, but absolutely exhausting. Those issues are more urgent than ever. I believed in their importance more than ever. And now I was coming to see there are other ways to share these convictions, other energies to engage, other ways to do my part, other ways to coax the whole thing forward. It was this word, gift. Atoms and particles, spinning and swirling, keeping it all in motion. It's all an absurd, over-the-top, ridiculous gift to be here. I was beginning to see how many truths can only be communicated through parables and poems and surreal stories that don't make sense, but your heart knows are true in some very hard-to-describe way. I was starting to feel like I was in on the joke. I was starting to feel like the whole thing is an endless invitation. And you say yes again and again and again. And then you invite others to say yes with you. Yeah, so so there it is. That's, that's the uh, process of process. Um, again, the, toward the end there, you know, talked about you, you, you do this thing again and again and again. That's, and that's what process theology is. You go through this process of moving toward, and Bell, maybe even in Whitehead's mind, might have been a little blasphemous there where he, you know, he, you know, uh, in his process, he's trying to coax. Well, uh, according to Whitehead, that's God's position to do the coaxing. <laughs> to, uh, Whitehead calls it luring. He lures you toward uh, these tor- sorts of ends. Uh, but you saw some of the practical uh, types of ideas that that uh, Bell has. You know, planet care. I'm assuming that's global warming, and you know, his, his political agenda and that sort of thing. Um, but this would be a great time to point out some of the dangers in this, which uh, hopefully we'll get to even more. And you've probably already seen them. I mean, we've already rejected the the you know the age-old definition of God from the Shema, nonetheless. Um, that's That might be a problem. That might be a little bit dangerous uh, if it turns out not to be true that, you know, the, the Whitehead's wrong and that, that God actually is, uh, as he's been described for these many, many hundreds, thousands of years. Um, might, might be an issue. It's clever. No question it's clever. Uh, but, you know... That's one danger. The other danger is is that maybe Bell has some really bad ideas. That's one thing that, that Whitehead lacks in in a lot of ways. He's 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 big on the metaphysics, maybe the big ideas and how God's involved in all this, but not very big on the specifics. Where do we get these ideas? This is, you know, again, this is this is Hegel's problem, is the this thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Um, thing doesn't uh, always produce the best ideas. I mean, wh- who's to say that the processes that are interacting in a certain situation with their with their ideas about what should be, what's important, um, what 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 you should try to coax somebody along on, um, are the right things to do? H- how do we judge that? By what standard do we judge those things? So Whitehead is very short on ethics. Let me say that. And leaves it very wide open. He, he just talks about having this aesthetic um, finality in a sense. So he, ha- so he has an end goal for this particular interaction between these couple of processors, or these three or four processors, or this number of processors to come together to come to this other process and do this thing that is beautiful, satisfying, he would say. Um, but how do you judge that? How, is it, how do we judge the, the outcome of those interactions to be beautiful or satisfying or whatever? You know, by what standard do we judge those things? So, so we're already running into a couple things. You know, danger of redefining God. There's a number, number of implications there that I think I've talked about in many, other, many, many other podcasts podcast before, none the least of which is the one I always keep going back to, which is authority. Who has the authority to say that the, these two processes interacting and you know, coming to their synthesis is the, is the good and right thing? You know, what if Bell's definition of planet care is a really crappy definition that's going to hurt a lot of people? 
See, that's some of the problems here. Let's try to get through a few more of these. So many of those interviews I have been doing were about the concepts, the arguments, the intellectual battles that go on with religious people when they're defending their gods, head games, hair splitting, terms and definitions and labels. I found myself again and again trying to draw the discussion back to the stories we tell. Because some stories are better than others. Stories about a god who tortures people forever in hell shouldn't be told. They're terrible stories. They make people miserable. They make people want to kill themselves. Stories that insist that a few human beings are going to be okay and every other human being ever is doomed for eternity are horrible stories. But stories that fill us with wonder and awe, stories that remind us of who we truly are, stories that tell the truth about the mess we've made of things and how we can turn things around, these are stories we need more of. Right, another perfect example of what I was talking about before, which is the story of God torturing people in hell forever is a terrible story. Well, it's, it, it's, it's an uncomfortable topic, to be sure, that a perfectly just God would hold us accountable for our sin. See, we all know that Bell's a universalist because he wrote Love Wins. If you're not familiar with that book, it's basically just a repudiation of, again, another millennia-old teaching that God punishes sinners. And that sin deserves punishment. Um, you know, this is a topic that's pretty pretty easily refuted. To say, you know, if I just said to Bell, you know, if somebody murdered your wife, and they, on their way to the, you know, death penalty or on their dying day in prison, as probably he would have it. They spit in your face and said, I'd do it again in an instant, and we're unrepentant, and we're evil people. That that person is going to, you know, so this, see this how this gets dicey. Uh, when we start talking about um, justice issues, which I'm sure is near, to, near and dear to Bell's heart. Justice, right? That the God is a God of justice. And that... The guilty, if God is just, cannot go unpunished. And that's why Christ came to us. That's why he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary. Suffered, died, and was buried, and rose again on the third day, and ascended into heaven, as the creed teaches us. That's the whole point of it. So, as St. Paul teaches us, God can be the just and the justifier. See, that's why that all makes sense. Uh, because and this is what I tell, this is something so simple that I tell them, well, in my teenagers in my youth Bible class are not simple people. <laughs> they're very well uh, catechized. They know their Bibles and they're smart kids uh, and they get this. So if I say to one of them, okay, let's say um, I, I murder your father and this other child's father is the judge of the case. And I come before the judge, and it's you know it's been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that I've murdered your father. But yet that judge, when he he says yes, uh, Matt is obviously guilty of this murder, and really he deserves punishment for that murder. But because I'm a loving and gracious God, who gives everything as a gift, and there are no requirements for behavior. Matt goes free. Now, then I asked that, that other child, what would you call this other child's father? Would you call him a loving father? A loving judge? No, you would call him evil for, for allowing me to get away with murder scot-free. And the thing of it is, is that when people go, well, but it's but you're, attorney, you're, you're punishing um, temporal sins for, for eternity. Well... That's where you might be a little out of your depth here. Because God punishes sins eternally for a reason. Now, do we can we get our minds completely around that? Maybe not. Maybe we can't. But the point being that um that sin must be punished. Either Christ takes our punishment or we take our punishment. And 
according to Holy Scripture, according to God's Word, and that's where the authority should lie. That's the whole problem with this process theology idea. Again, another, that yeah, that, that main danger where who is the authority here? Is it Bell and him being this process, interacting with other process and the gift and the boogie da la la la? That's the authority? Where, you know, his his political agenda is, is somehow this luring, this drawing in to, of people to what God uh, is trying to lure us into. Yeah, that, that that's where this whole thing gets really dicey. Um, whereas, if we trust Holy Scripture as God's Word, then we have an objective, an objective, and outside of ourselves, uh, it's something we can point to, which Whitehead would completely deny, right? This whole thing's a process. We're, pro- we're, work- we're going to work it out. Us and God, we're all working it out. God's trying to draw us toward us. He's got all the infinite possibilities, and he's drawing all these processes toward this end, or an end, that'll go to another end, that'll synthesize it out to another end, and the process will continue, right? We're all kind of one here. God in everything. Um, no, um, I don't, I don't, I think that's just ethically speaking, enormously dangerous, enormously dangerous. Uh, because if we human beings have proved anything throughout history is we don't process toward, we don't process toward anything that I don't, I would say anybody would call objectively good and appealing. You can make those arguments, but and that might be something for another day where you say, oh, well, look at our world now. We're, you know, we're the best we've ever been. Oh, really? Well, <laughs> you know, 2020 may have proven that maybe that's not so much the case. And uh, that, that we need a return to these more traditional, time-tested understandings of who God is, what he demands of us, and um, what he calls us to, which is the gospel. To, be, to recognize our sin and to understand... Uh, that the grace is not, as Bell put it, grace is not unfair. Christ paid the penalty for our sin. So God, for God to give us grace, it's completely fair. The the parable of the workers in the vineyard, yes, are, are talking about uh, people who are trying to work their way into God's grace. And it doesn't work. You don't work your way into God's grace. The way you are brought into God's grace is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the point of that parable. Not that grace is unfair. That's not the point at all. All right, let's get some more in here. Specifically that part about here. There was something hidden in that word here, something subtle and significant, an assumption, an assumption that we'd stay here. We had been giving the same answer for so long, it had become embedded in our thinking. We're here, we're not leaving, this is the story. A belief so nuanced as to be almost imperceptible that this is just how it is. And suddenly we saw it. We can change how it is. And once you see, you can't unsee. Spirit often exposes the assumptions we've been living with that we haven't been aware of. Sometimes we've accepted rules and codes and limits without realizing it. And then spirit blows in and exposes those assumptions, showing us how limited we've been, what we haven't seen. We see what we don't have to accept, how we can make new rules. Spirit often reveals the ways in which we have ever so subtly submitted to the belief that this is just how it is. Spirit refuses to accept that this is just how it is, because spirit is inherently creative. Spirit shows us new possibilities about how it works, about what we have the power to change. What if this wasn't how it is? What if we changed it? What if we decided to do something else? Kristen and I didn't see it coming, and then bang, there it was. Yeah, so there's another um, big whitehead word, creativity. That's his, that is it, that is the ultimate reality to whitehead, is creativity. And my question to Pell on this score might be, spirit blows in and tells you, hey, you know what, it, it, it's cool if you go have uh, a sexual relationship with somebody else besides Christian. Yeah, there, there might be some thesis antithesis there. Because um, the way between men and women have been this way and always will be. Anything outside of that has fallen woefully short. 
you can't find you can't show me an example uh, of something other than that anywhere in the world that has been that that's been that way and again spoiling it down to Bell's marriage um I, I I don't ever think in a million years he would think of running off with some woman or having you know multiple partners or what maybe he would but when you know what if the spirit is opening your mind to that you see that's why this is dangerous because why Bell might not go for something like that you might you might think, oh, well, yeah, I need to open my mind. You know, you go to your wife, say, you know, honey, I need to open my mind to other possibilities. Spirit has blown in and told me I need to do da 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 right? And you'd be surprised. I mean, it sounds crass. It sounds ridiculous. Uh, but that stuff happens all the time. And without some external, outside of ourselves, concrete, objective morality and ethic, this becomes a problem. Let's finish it out. There's a story in the book of Genesis about a man named Abraham who leaves his father's household. Your father's household in the ancient Near East was an entire way of life, economics, family, authority, worldview, gods, where you get your food. Leaving that was leaving the known and heading into the unknown, from something that's established to something that doesn't exist yet. Strange how the writer doesn't explain why Abraham leaves other than saying he hears a divine voice. Something intimate and infinite is calling to him and he listens. There's this line, then Abraham went. It's such a short line, so easy to skip over, but absolutely massive, because people didn't do that at that time. The widespread understanding was that history is like an endless cycle, and what happened to your parents' parents then happened to your parents and would eventually happen to you. Everything is some version of a repeat of what came before. This story then, the one about Abraham leaving, is revolutionary. It's a step forward in human consciousness. You can step out of the cycle. You can leave and head into the unknown. You can step into something that hasn't happened yet, that doesn't exist yet. What an incredible new idea. And the writer doesn't give us any explanation why. Abraham heard, and then he went. He heard something? That's the best the writer can do? That's so vague, ambiguous, fuzzy. Exactly. Sometimes the most powerful truths in a story are the ones that are never explicitly stated. This story has endured because it's true to how it works. Something rises up within you, something internal, some force, some voice, some compelling urge to go. You get some shape, a little texture, a glimpse of what direction to head in. You get just enough so you can take the next step, but not enough to take the risk and faith and fear out of it. I knew I had new things to create. I knew there were new spaces to do my work in. I knew that there was a whole world of people like me more spiritually hungry than ever. But beyond that, it was the unknown. Yeah, all right. Again, another perfect example. Um, the reason this story is endured is because God spoke to Abraham. There was no, it was, there's nothing in Narthus about who, who called Abraham out of Ur, the Chaldeans. It was God. If you, if God appears to you, um, however he might or speaks to you, this is, this is, uh, this is what you listen to. This, it's not, there's, there's nothing there. Where Bell is getting this is straight from Whitehead, Whiteheadian theology, uh, process theology. To say that there's something, well, there's something drawing you towards, something pulling you into a new, um, state of human consciousness and conception. That's that's Whitehead process theology, and when Bell says he, that's how that's the lens through which he sees all of Holy Scripture, that's again uh, Whitehead process philosophy. You put that lens on of what's real is the journey, the process, and you start to look at everything through that. And that's how Bell interprets Scripture, which is why he just completely discounts the fact that God spoke to Abraham. Quite literally, I mean that's that's what the text is trying to teach. Again, you won't find any tradition, even in the ancient rabbinic traditions, that say, "Oh, well, this is a, you know, this was a feeling Abraham had, or he, you know, he felt God speak to his heart." As, as some evangelicals might say today, there's there's nothing in the text about that. It's God spoke to Abraham. Now you can choose to believe that God spoke to Abraham and said, "Hey, hit the road." calling you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to go here, 
where I'm going to establish you as a great nation that will bring about the Messiah. That's the new thing that's going to come about in a sense, but it's still the ancient thing that was promised to Eve. God fulfilling his promises. That's what God does. Um, so anyway, point being, I think I think we've got some good process theology stuff going on here, although I think even on this score, Bell does a very weak job of it. Because, I, again, it wasn't until I got to this chapter I was like, oh, okay, I think I see what's going on here. Um, just, you know, having the background that I did, knowing kind of the lingo, you know, stuff like events and and uh, and so on and so forth. You know, the luring toward is just just some of this language. And and I'm almost absolutely convinced that the bell has been exposed to this, likes it, um, doesn't view God at it, you know in a in a traditional theistic way or even a deistic way. Um, he he views God as the the prime example of how we humans are to go through this life. And we're all processes. And God's one of the processes along with us. And um, that's 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 how life will go. It'll ebb and flow. And he talks about how the atoms and everything, you know, hey, we were we were this thing and the other thing, and now we're now we're different things, and we're all we're all just so interconnected. That's that's Whiteheadian language. Um, and again, the prime danger is twofold. Um, the redefinition of, of God as traditionally understood. And um, and a complete, uh, you know, lack of foundation for an ethic, for morality. Um, and then, therefore, because you have no foundation for morality or ethics, you really have no foundation for the gospel. Without the law, there is no gospel. Uh, if, we, if we aren't sinners in need of grace, then, um, then Christ's crucifixion uh, was, was for nothing. Um, he was just a, he was just a guy that got killed. That's what that's what Bell would say unjustly. The guy that was that was killed unjustly, and we could talk about that and how unjust you know uh, imperialistic governments are. That's that's about the best Bell can do with it. Um, aside from that, so at any rate, got to quit. Um, pretty heavy uh, trying to trying to bring bring in this notion of process theology. But I think that's what what Bell's doing with his book. Again, took me a while to figure it out. He wasn't terribly obvious with it at first uh, a lot of meanderings a lot of his uh you know recapitulations of his old political and theological standpoints which he's written numerous books on and you know i think in some ways he's out of material if he wants to write a book on process theology she just do it you know just talk about how you know hey i'm rob bell and i buy into process theology and here's my deal uh if that's what he was going for maybe he was maybe he wasn't but i saw a lot of the signals here Anyway, got to go this week. Please contri contribute to the Men of Steel project. Um, any donation would be very helpful at this point. I know things are crazy right now and tight, uh, but we're going to keep pushing toward that uh, to, to provide some vocational training um, in the realm of trucks for former inmates. Hope you'll give to that. At any rate, there it is for this week. We'll see you next time.